Now, when we think about the origin of agriculture, there are a variety of different theories that have been put forward to try and explain its development. It occurs independently in different parts of the world at different times, but all between about 5,000 and 15,000 years ago. In some ways, this development of different regional styles of agriculture parallels the development of different regional forms in the Pleistocene. When we think back to Homo erectus occupying different geographical places on the landscape, and the development of different regional characteristic suites of traits, that in some ways corresponds to the regional diversity we see in the origins of agriculture. And yet, we can interpret the origins of agriculture as perhaps the most significant evidence of intensification in our evolutionary past. That large increase in population size at the end of the Pleistocene necessitated humans to begin to change and intensify their ecological relationship to the environment around them. One of the things we see at the end of the Pleistocene is hominid populations beginning to utilize more marginal resources. So for example, even in Neanderthals, we see evidence of them eating grasses and seeds from grasses. These are very low quality resources and ones you wouldn't necessarily exploit unless you had to unless you needed to get more out of the environment to sustain your large and growing population. We can see this in evidence, for example, from tortoises that have been captured and used for food. Now, tortoises are creatures that grow continuously throughout their life. So the larger they are, the older they are. And obviously, a larger tortoise represents a larger package of a meal than a smaller one. And yet, when we look at the archaeological record from late Pleistocene sites from the Near East, we find that average tortoise size, the average size of these creatures that the humans were exploiting, goes down. We interpret this as an increase, in, again, in intensification, an increase in the ability of humans or the need of humans to extract resources out of their environment. They're accepting smaller and smaller tortoises, or at least they're killing the bigger and bigger ones, which leads to an overall decline in the size of your average tortoise in the population. This is, again, an evidence of ecological intensification, extracting more out of the environment. Now, the other problem that develops as you become more intense is you become more vulnerable to shocks in your environment environmental change that might not allow for you to get what you need. So one of the other lenses with which we can interpret this transition to agriculture is a need to mitigate risk. If you're a hunter-gatherer population that's focusing on killing caribou, if you miss the population of caribou that's migrating through your area, you're in deep trouble. Suddenly, the primary source of food for your population has gone away. One way of mitigating that risk is to have fallback foods. A good fallback food is one that's abundant and easily obtainable. Things like grasses, for example, the basic kind of grasses that form the basis of a lot of the origins of agriculture, such as wheat, fit this category exactly. So when we start seeing populations exploit these basic grasses, um, that might be an indication that these are fallback foods, that they're more stable. They allow the population to mitigate the risk of catastrophic failure in their increasingly intense ecological existence. So the initial beginnings of agriculture may have been completely unintentional. It wasn't done with the intent of creating an agricultural crop, but rather exploiting more stable resources. Exploiting these stable resources like grasses would have allowed populations to persist for a longer period of time. They would have been able to avoid the catastrophic shock that comes with this ecological intensity and its reliance on a hunter-gatherer existence. And yet by beginning to exploit things like grasses more intensively, we began to change the biology of those grasses themselves they began to evolve actually to be better suited to be cultivated by us. We in turn as populations begin to rely on them more extensively. So the origin of agriculture we might view as a co-evolution between humans and the plants and animals that we began to domesticate. As their biology changed as we exploited them more, our biology changed to correspond to the increased utilization of them. So plants that by themselves are fairly marginal, things like grasses, wheat, corn, barley, these basic stocks that became staples of the agricultural development, the agricultural revolution, are things that are fundamentally not all that great. They're not great food items, but they have the advantage of being abundant and very predictable and able to be produced on a large scale so that you can support a large population. So for these large populations that began to appear at the end of the Pleistocene, as human technology and the human cultural niche had expanded, agriculture became an essential transition point. And again, a major transition point for understanding variation in humans today. The agricultural revolution is arguably the most significant evolutionary event in our past. It's also the most recent. It represents what I would consider one of the three fundamental transitions in human evolution. The first being the origins of bipedality, the second being the beginning of brain expansion with the genus Homo at the beginning of the Pleistocene, and the final one being this transition to an agricultural existence. The last step, or the most recent major step, in our process of ecological intensification.